Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength. service, Lord. Help us to get from your word exactly what you intended. We thank you for your love and for your mercy. We pray for those that are traveling. They get here safely. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, Psalm chapter 112. Psalm 112 is where we'll be. Psalm 112. <clears throat> Way back in August of last year, in my... Uh, my reading Bible and soul winning Bible, I made a note, August, maybe September, leading towards October, <clears throat> said something like, when men rise for fear, and this was a song at that time that as, as things were going on here in the church and in around, around myself, uh, I was reading this psalm and it encouraged me greatly. Psalm 112. I intended, I believe, to preach it, but I don't know if I ever got around to it. Maybe I just referenced it once in a while. But Psalm 112, a great psalm of encouragement. And I've titled the message today from Psalm 112, Springboard for Sanctification. Springboard for Sanctification. I'll read the whole chapter. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. 
The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. So here you see many times in the context of this psalm, righteousness being mentioned upon a person. His righteousness endureth forever. I love that, how it calls to remembrance his blessing. It says the righteousness shall be of this man in everlasting remembrance. His desire shall be seen upon his enemies. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. That phrase, his righteousness endureth forever, is a phrase attributed unto the Lord. And yet here in the context, it is the man that is receiving this. It is the man that praise the Lord. It's a man that is blessed by fearing the Lord and that delighteth here directly, greatly within his commandments. <clears throat> so here, as I said, I call this springboard to sanctification. These aren't just stepping stones that I'm going to be talking about, but rather right in that first verse, you find uh, three different ideas or three different things that actually launch a person into a life well lived for the Lord here. Now before I get to that, I want to point to verse 10. It says here, the wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And one thing that we need to remember is that as we begin to live more Christ-like, in other words, attributing and reflecting and acting out and serving with Christ's uh, general characteristics upon us, because that's what it means to be Christ-like, to be Christian. As we do that more and more and more, we will tend to draw attention to ourselves. And here, very clearly, it says, the wicked shall see it. What do they see? Well, they see the might, the wealth, the righteousness, the graciousness, and all of these things that come upon a person because they praise the Lord, fear the Lord, and delight greatly in His commandments. What do the wicked do? First, they see it. Then they're grieved. Then they gnash with their teeth. But fear not, they are very quickly melting away and they perish in their own bitterness, in their own state of gnashing and being grieved and seeing and just hating what is going on in the life of the righteous. They melt away and they perish. And all of this is a direct result of your walk within the will of God. As Noah, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, our obedience both condemns the world and causes us to be heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So when we walk according to the commandments, when we walk according to God's will, we are causing that the unrighteous are condemned by our obedience. We are also growing in the righteousness of Christ and it's becoming us. In other words, the attributes that are given to our our perfect man, our new man, are starting to reflect upon our flesh and we are acting, in fact, more Christ-like. We condemn the world by this. We also become the heirs of the same righteousness which we attributed to our own selves by faith but actually walking in these things. What the Bible teaches in that story of Noah and the obedience referred to in Hebrews chapter 11 is that as we grow, they go. As we grow and we become empowered and we become more righteous and more in line with the commands of God, they go away. Even as the context of the scripture says, they melt away. They, they perish in their own grieved state, in their own gnashing upon us with their teeth. We grow, they go. And through faith we do this. Through faith we springboard ourselves into sanctification and into blessing. And as I mentioned before, the three springboards that I find here are praise unto the Lord, fearing the Lord, and greatly delighting in His commandments. The first you see is praise. Praise to God word is always something that gives great power unto the believer. You are lifting up God. You are lifting up the Father. You are lifting up Christ in praise unto Him. You are, admon or you are admiring Him. You are approving of Him. You are showing great gratitude towards Him. Lauding Him and extolling Him is a similar phrase to praising the Lord. The Bible records of John the Baptist saying this statement, He must increase, I must decrease. He must be lifted up, I must be put down low. And as we lift up God in praise, as this statement, as this psalm begins, when it says, Praise ye the Lord, we ought to have the attitude of praise when it comes to meditating upon, thinking about, uh, desiring our Savior. We need to give Him praise and direct it always to Him. He must increase I must decrease. I must lift him up and by default lower myself in my own eyes. 
The first mention of praise can be found, and you can keep your place there in Psalm chapter 112. We'll be back there. Way back in Genesis, though, you'll find the first mention of the word praise. And this indicates the direction of where praise ought to always go. I know this is probably common sense, but it's interesting to me always to find what the Bible says in those first mentions of a word. It'll give you perhaps a definition, or it'll give you in the context how it ought to be enacted. So Again, Genesis chapter 29, Genesis 29, way back at the beginning... The Bible says, and she conceived and bare a son, and she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. This indicates to me that the name Judah is indicative of praising the Lord. Praising the Lord is what she says. I will praise the Lord. And therefore, she called the name of the child Judah and left bearing after this time. And you'll find again in the second mention in Genesis chapter 49, a few pages over, Genesis chapter 49, when the particular blessings were given unto the sons of Israel, Israel or Jacob said of Judah in Genesis, 29, or Genesis 49 and verse 8, he said, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass is colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and is clothed in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Now, according to the Bible in the New Testament, it says, It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. And even more so when you see a passage of Scripture like this, though it is somewhat veiled in the dark sayings of prophecy as Jacob is giving the last day's prophecies upon these children of his, and somehow somewhat veiled in there, you'll see very quickly that it is evident that Christ sprang out of Judah. It's more so evident that our praises ought to be directed towards him. So he says, he says, Judah in verse 8, thou art he whom thy brethren shall Praise, And he begins to talk about him being a lion's whelp. He says, The scepter, in verse 10, shall not depart from Judah until a lawgiver from between his feet, or a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. In other words, Christ here, as Shiloh, pictured by the scepter of Judah, is all an indication of where our praise ought to go. Yes, here it's to the tribe of Judah, and in a picture or in a type, Jacob is offering Judah as this recipient of it, but we know, according to the scriptures and New Testament giving clarity, that it is evident that the Lord sprang out of this same tribe. And it's even more evident that our praise ought to go toward him. You can go back to Psalm 112. You can go back to Psalm 112. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, that specific phrase is mentioned 33 times in the Bible. And I encourage you, if you go and you have a Bible search software, type in praise the Lord and just go and see. You'll find many psalms that record that same phrase. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord, sing praises unto Him. And as you get closer, one of my favorite here is at the very end of the book of Psalms, it says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. Everything that breathes the air that God gives unto it ought to be praising God, and we're no different. We ought to be praising the Lord in the same. Sing praises unto Him. Just one springboard to our own sanctification is a right and good and righteous and just praise unto the God that gives us power and strength to do according to His will. Praise, again, puts the Lord in the right place. It puts Him first, and it extols Him for being there. It lifts Him up for being there. It admonishes, shows gratitude. It hails Him. It lauds Him. It extols Him for being in the very position that He is, and it's just us acknowledging and recognizing it. The next point that I want to point out, the next springboard to our own personal sanctification in Psalm 112 is fearing God. And I believe that praise and fear are basically just two sides of the same coin. Our praise is acknowledging God in His position and recognizing it, acknowledging it, giving credence, giving onus to it. 
The fear is simply God activating his own position upon us. When we see God in his power, we are driven to fear, which drives us to acknowledge that by praising him and of the same. So fear is just a very real and righteous response to the God that created all things, to the terrible God, to the King of kings, Lord of lords. Being in the proper submission to and abiding in his fear keeps us safe. The Bible says of the fear of God, the fear of the Lord, it says it's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of understanding. And as such, it's a good place for the Christian to be, especially the ones that seek to be in a godly state. With proper fear before the living God, they are in a prime position to grab a hold of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. As you continue, you'll see the fear of the Lord, that specific phrase mentioned 30 times in the Bible. And as you read it, you're going to find Proverbs and you're going to find Psalms and just ring with that phrase. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. And some things that the fear of the Lord is, the fear of the Lord does what? It prolongeth days. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord tendeth or gravitates towards life. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. By it, the Bible says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. In other words, when you have the right fear before the living God, you're not going to do evil because you know that the living God is waiting there to come down upon you if you do. You have a right fear of him. It's a healthy fear of him. Just as I had a healthy fear for my own father, and all it took was him barking, Josh! Oh, 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 I'd, I'd spring into action. I'd be in right position. I'll do the same thing to kill. Having a right fear of having me come down on him is not right. In fact, it puts him in a safe position. When he wanders towards traffic, you kind of go, Caleb, right? And he jumps and he stops what he's doing and he kind of backs away and, and restrains himself. It's, it's a godly fear. It's a right fear. And we ought to live in that position with God. When God says, thou shall not, we need to react with a, whoa, hang, hang on, whoops. And then, and then find ourselves falling back from where we were headed to do the right thing. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. By it, that's what men do. They depart from evil. And this is just another springboard under sanctification. We're not going to take baby steps by doing things like this. We're going to jump right into being sanctified by God. What's the first one? Praising Him. Giving the proper onus. Giving Him the proper acknowledging of His position. Fear, allowing the position that God's already in to put us in a, in a deep state of humility before him and having the right fear for him. These will make you jump into a sanctified, righteous living, a righteous life because you've jumped on these two characteristics and you're trying to live them out in your life. The next one that you see is delight there in Psalm 112. He that delighteth, it says, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. We too, we're to delight greatly in the commandments of God. And not just doing them, not just grudgingly going about and doing the will of the Father just as somebody would do the will. I mean, when I was a little kid, I would always, um, my dad would have different chores for me to do on a summer day, right? And I'd spend my whole summer day just kind of wasting it away and doing whatever I felt like. And then in the last half an hour, I'd rush around and I'd do the chores that I had to do. Rather grudgingly, like the job that my dad gave me to do, it was interrupting my wonderful summer, right? I begrudgingly did the commands and I didn't do a very good job and it was kind of half-hearted and it wasn't right. We shouldn't be the same way when God lays down commandments to just wait until the last minute to obey. We gotta jump on it. We gotta be willing to obey. But more than that, more than just being ready to obey quickly, we need to rejoice and delight, the Bible says, greatly in his commandments. We need to take pleasure in them. We need to take happiness in them. Have joy in keeping the commandments of God, in reading the commandments of God, in absorbing the commandments of God, and following after them. We need to have amusement found in it, and excitement when we hear the Bible preached, and when we move towards being obedient to the commands that come towards us. In all the commandments, and I would say even at large, the very law of God, as we read through the Old Testament, we ought to rejoice and find joy in those things. Obviously, certain contexts of Scripture, certainly portions, will, will, will kind of bore you, will kind of trouble you, or they'll be very hard to read, and our flesh doesn't 
like it. But this is why we need to put down our flesh. We need to render it crucified so that our inward man can truly rejoice. And that rejoicing of the inward man can begin to be mirrored in the very flesh that we have. Honestly, when I first started reading through the Old Testament, it was grudging. But after a while, it grew on me. And now, one of my most popular, most common reading portions is often from the Old Testament. I love reading the law. I take great delight in reading the law. The law strengthens me. The law leads me in the ways of righteousness. And so many good things come from reading the Old Testament law. And I don't find it grievous anymore. That's not to say that I couldn't fall away and fall into old patterns, but if I keep my heart willing to love the law and willing to be in lockstep with it and willing to find joy and excitement in reading it, then that will come. Psalm chapter 1, the Bible records this in verse 1. It said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Here, the law of the Lord, meditated upon day and night, brings delight to the man that is blessed. If you're to be a blessed man, what are you to do? You're to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You're not to stand in the way of sinners. You're not to fall into the traps, into the ways of this world, but rather you're to delight in the ways of God, delight in the law of the Lord. Psalm chapter 1 is often called the blessed man psalm because it highlights the fact that either you're going to be blessed or you're going to be ungodly. You need to make your choice. And right away it tells you that the blessed man delights in the law of the Lord and meditates therein day and night. It becomes his very meditation. It becomes the food by which his mind is constantly devouring and constantly eating and constantly absorbing. We need to have that same delight for the law of God, just as we have the same, a certain delight for sports on television or for watching movies or for all the things that the world will offer you, the games, the toys, the 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 imaginations, the, the different things that the world is constantly throwing at, what our friends want to do. You know, we had to take that same delight and do our best to attribute it and to give it and to donate it entirely unto God, because then you truly are a blessed man. The opposite is to walk in the way of sinners. This same blessed man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You want prosperity in life? It doesn't come from the big car. It doesn't come from the right job. It doesn't come from having opportunities put before you from this world and grabbing hold of them. No, prospering in this life comes from delighting in the law of the Lord and allowing for the law to work in us righteousness, which brings us as a tree and plants us by living waters that we can grow thereby. What a greater place for a tree to be is to be planted right next to rivers of water where they can get exactly what they need from the waters that give life unto them. And that's what the law of the Lord does unto the Christian. It gives him the flowing rivers of water which constantly give him the life whereby he can prosper and delight in those same laws. Psalm chapter 37, Psalm 37 talks about delighting in the law of the Lord. Psalm chapter 37 in verse 3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, verily thou shalt be fed. So here we're giving trust unto God and, and basically seeking him and doing what he says because God only desires for us to do good. And so shall we dwell in the land and verily we will be fed, we will be provided for, we will have the sustenance that we need, the rivers of water if we were that tree planted next to it. Verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the new day. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. What I wanted to focus was verse 4. It says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. This isn't saying that God's going to give you uh, the big car that you're lusting after. He's not going to give you the big house that you're lusting after. He's not going to give you the, uh, the, the new toy, the new video, the new whatever, all the things that are flesh desires. No, rather, if we're delighting in the Lord and His law, He's going to 
align our lives with that and give us the desires of our heart. Not our corrupt and wicked and abominable heart, but our changed heart that has new life in it, that has new desires in it. If you feast on the word, you will have no choice but to be drawn unto the very word. Why? Because that's where we're sustained. That's where our life comes from. Nobody's actually drawn to death. Rather, death takes hold of us. The, the drug addict isn't drawn unto the needle that he puts in his arm, but rather it becomes him. It becomes what he needs. Take that same drug addict, get him saved, and have him be transformed by a new need, which was the word of God, and he will suddenly delight in that. He will be drawn unto that. That same addiction can be transferred unto a right thing and a good thing. Men are just creatures of habit. And if we make our habit drinking and doing drugs, then that's all we will desire and that's all we will delight in. But if we make our habit to seek the word of God and his righteousness, that will become us. That will become our habit. That will become our desire. We will be changed in the inward man and our old man will have no choice but to follow along with it. But it comes from, again, praising God, fearing God and delighting in his law. Verse 23 of that same psalm says this, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. If you're seeking to be a good man, your steps will be ordered by the Lord. He will guide you in the paths of life, in all the things that he desires for you, which is always the best that God desires for us, and he delighteth in his way. We will delight in that same path. A lot of people think that the Christian life is just is just boredom, and it's just restricting. No, it couldn't be more liberating. It couldn't be more free. When you follow God's commands and allow him to order your steps, he will bring you to the desired end that he desires for you, and it's always more beneficial. It's Amen. always more blessed than what the world will ever have to offer you. Psalm 40 and verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. We ought to delight to do his law. And then if you were to look to Psalm 119, I'll just read through these quickly. Think on them as we do. Psalm 119, that great and long psalm that speaks of the word of God with such reverence. In verse 16, Psalm 119 in verse 16. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Verse 24. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Verse 35. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Over in verse 47. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Imagine having a great love for the commandments of God. Psalm 119, verse 47 says, I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Verse 70, their heart is as fat as Greeks, but I delight in thy law. The world is this, these fat and unhealthy and, and nasty hearts. They're full of grease. Right? But I delight in thy law. That's, that's the contrast, is delighting and enjoying the very laws of God. Verse 77, let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live. For thy law is my delight. The psalmist sings out of his delight for God, recognizing that the tender mercies are following soon behind and giving life unto him for his delight in the very words of God. Verse 92, unless thy law had been my delight, I should then have perished in mine affliction. Next time you're going through some things, think about a psalm like this. Verse 92 where it says, unless the law had been my delight. And that's a past tense statement. Unless I had already delighted in the laws of God, I should have perished in my affliction. Sadly, sometimes once we get into afflictions, we recognize the great folly that the law of God was not our delights in the past. And then we find ourselves in these horrible affliction and circumstances that are rough and tough and hard and very draining and, and just, just destroy us. And we recognize we should have had the law of God as our delight. But again, remember we're talking about springboards to sanctification. So now make the decision. Delight in the law. And then when you come to affliction, you won't be subdued. You won't be taken over by it. Delight in the laws of God. Fear Him. Give praise unto Him. And these three will come together and they will help you in your life 
to be more and more and more sanctified, set aside for the master's use. Look over in verse 143. Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet thy commandments are my delight. So even when trouble and anguish comes upon a man, he can still delight in the commandments of God and have freedom and have what? Have pleasure, have happiness, have joy, have excitement, have amusement. These are all the things that the world is trying to offer us at large. They're, they're pushing the amusement park, the, the joy, the happiness, the, the travel, the vacations, the money, the cars, the, the this, the that. The world is just trying to offer these things. But in the end, I find the more, the more, the more, the more you follow the path of the world, trouble and anguish will come our way. And we're as Christians brought to the point where we need to recognize that the commandments were our delight to begin with. Delight in the commandments of God. Verse 174, oh, I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord. Thy law is my delight. The law of God brings the very salvation to the soul of the Christian who is in trouble, who is in anguish, who is in turmoil, who is in trouble. That delight enters in and they have all the joys that they needed to begin with. Don't need to go searching for this. Verse 175, you just keep reading down. He says, let my soul live and it shall praise thee. And let thy judgments help thee. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. And here it's great because those three springboards that we had talked about, delighting in the law of God, verse 175 talks about praising the Lord that his judgments help us in the time of need. And verse 176, I have gone astray. That great fear of running astray from God, asking him to seek him, asking him to come back, asking his mercies to return. It ends off that great psalm about the law with those three springboards we talked about. Having fear, having right praise, and having delight in the law of God. This will help us so much in our sanctification life, in our growing in the righteousness of God. If we do these things, we will achieve, as the Bible says, great success. We will be springing forward greatly in this area of sanctification. We will be blessed and as promised, we'll receive exactly what is described. Go back to Psalm 112, exactly what's described there. He says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. He shall be mighty. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his health. His righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor. And the good man is that same blessed man that feareth God, delights in his commandments, and gives praise unto him. A good man here showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He, his heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. There's great deliverance offered here. In verse 9, he hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted here with great honor as promised the blessings upon the man that feareth God the blessings upon the man that praises God the blessings upon the man that delighteth greatly in the commandment are innumerable mighty seed which means your children are going to be great in influence great in numbers wealth lasting righteousness graciousness showing favor unto others and lending having compassion steadfastness leaving a legacy, being remembered, being fearless, being exalted, and being honored. These are all things that the world offers a cheap substitute for, but that God promises if we'll simply lift him up in the proper way, praising him, fearing him, and delighting greatly in his commandments, letting his commandments work in us because we've set up the right foundation that's chiefly based on praise and proper fear for the God of all. Great promises and blessings here again, are the springboard of our Christian life. But I also want to encourage us, you can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, I also want to encourage us that while there are all these great and pre precious blessings and promises to those 
that fear him, to those that praise him, for those that delight in his path. There's also the other side of these things. It's the springboard unto righteousness. It's the springboard unto us living a sanctified life. But in order to be fully balanced, we have to make sure that it's also not only our springboard, but our landing strip. What do I mean by this? Well, when somebody gets mighty in seed, their wealth increases, righteousness increases, graciousness, compassion, steadfastness, being fearless, being exalted, they get lifted up with pride. And this is why all of those, while they are your springboard to sanctification, they also need to be your ground. You need to be solidified and brought to a humble position, grounded by these same traits, by praise of the Lord, by fear of the Lord, by delighting in his commandments, lest we get too high and mighty for ourselves. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land where ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life that thy days may be Prolong. The purpose here of the law is that it would be teach to many and days would be prolonged. Here in the context within the land that they live, but for us of the same. That we, where we abide, would have prolonging of our own days. If you look over in verse 24, it says, And the Lord commanded us to do these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. That he might preserve us alive as it is at this day and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us and even as we live today built in the foundation of Christ being the chief cornerstone we can build our righteousness by observing to do these commandments as it is this day right we believe on Christ for salvation and that is settled but if we endeavor to, if we observe to do the commandments and to seek after God's will and to follow after God's will, we can build our righteousness upon that foundation of Christ's righteousness. His being the only that's ever going to give us into heaven, but ours being the one that will get us rewarded once we get there. And here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we find the stern warning to those that start obeying the commandments. They have a right fear of God. They're launching into sanctification by delighting in His will, by praising Him, by doing all the things that the psalmist begins to extol us to do, but they just launch off and they don't prepare for the landing that is to come. And the landing strip always has to be those same three attributes of praise, fear, and delight in Him, lest we fall into the trap. Verse 6 says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates do you get the impression that not only is the love of the commandments of God something we need to spring our Christian life forward with but it's also something here that we need to ground ourselves with why the Bible is encouraging us and they commanding us that we would teach those same statutes of the children that are after us and the children that are after us and the children that are after us as it said in verse 2 to thy son and thy son's son all the days of thy life that that would be the foundation by which your whole family is built upon the law of God the statutes the judgments of God the commandments that are given in the law need to be taught to the children they also need to be bound upon thine hand well whenever you look to do something with your hand you need to have the Bibles before you as frontlets before your eyes like blinders the Word of God needs to be before you on the posts of the very doors of your house the Word of God needs to be before you we don't need to do this in the literal sense necessarily but spiritually speaking the Word of God needs to be always in our meditation, before us on our hands, before us in our eyes, before us as we leave our house, upon the hearts and souls of our very children as we teach them day and night, as we walk and as we sit, 
And as we go and as we rise up and as we sit down, the Word of God needs to be that constant grounding, bringing us unto Him so that we can grow in righteousness. Because there is a very present danger that what will happen is all those blessings of a mighty seed, wealth, lasting righteousness, graciousness, compassion, steadfastness, that legacy that you leave to those that are behind you, fearlessness, and the exaltation of others and honor before men will all threaten to have you fall, even as you sprung up, fall just as fast. Verse 10 of this same Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy father. So this is the promised land. This is the land of Christian obedience. They have stepped forward in faith and they have landed in the land which he sware unto their fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou builtest not. So completely by inheritance they received of the gift. Even as we completely by inheritance have received Received of the gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. Verse 11 says, And the houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells dig, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. And here is the warning When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord. And this is what happens to so many Christians is that they will springboard into godly Christian living by praising the Lord for all he has done, by having the right fear for him, delighting even his commandments, reading them greatly, large portions of scriptures and just loving the Bible. They launch into sanctification. They grow. And they're what we call those, those firecracker Christians where they're just like, and they skyrocket into godly Christian living, but then it's poof and they just fall to the ground. This is not how we should live our Christian life and that we are standing upon the inheritance that Christ hath gave us. We step out in faith, we're praising Him, we're fearing Him, we're delighting always in His ways and we have sprung board into sanctification and we're growing at record rates and everyone around us seems to be eating our dust as we're growing in Christian morals and we're growing in Christian righteousness and we're doing Christian things but we did not plan for the landing. We need to ground ourselves on the same faith and the same grasp of scriptures that launched us forward into sanctification. We need to be counting on that same thing to be our landing script, to be our solid ground, to be what we will eventually land upon. Lest when we are full of inheritance that we have received, that has been given to us by the word of God as we came to him in praise and fear and delight and we were grown by the very scriptures that we did not write and we are sanctified by the preaching that we did not study and we are enjoying the psalms and hymns that we did not Right, right. All these things, these blessings innumerable are coming upon us. We're doing the right things before God and we've launched ourselves into sanctification. Beware lest thou forget the Lord. We need to remember that we need to be always grounded upon his scriptures. Lest we spring into Christian life and fall flat. We need to prepare to have that same landing script. Most things in the Christian life are reciprocal. They're cycles. God also often talks about the, the wind whirling about, how the seas draw up the, the water and then it becomes clouds and the clouds fall upon the earth and draws up the water again. Life is full of cycles and even so the Christian life must be full of cycles. So just as it says in Psalm 112 that we need to come out praising, be blessed by fearing God, delighting in His commandments, and that's how we need to springboard into the very blessings that come upon us. We need to not get full of the blessings that come upon us and forget the Lord that gave him. Rather, we need to be ready always to be back into that same position of praise and fear and delight of the same laws and just grow in those and grow in those and grow in those and constantly be stepping forward in the Christian life and not find ourselves at risk of eating of the blessings, being full of the blessings and fallen for forgetting the God that gave them. This needs to be constantly the springboard of sanctification, but don't forget that this also needs to be the ground, the landing strip. The solid rock that we need to stand upon is Christ first, but what we build upon him by praise for him, by fear of him, by the delight in the commands that he gives us in the doing of the same. This is godly Christian living, and this is how we get it started. This is how we get the ball rolling. This is how we really start to grow. But keep yourself grounded in these same 
things. And that way you will have great success, as the Bible says. That way you will delight in the paths that he sets before you. He will order the very steps that you have before you. And it's only through obedience and keeping yourself grounded upon these very truths that we just talked about. Psalm 112, a great psalm that talks about the blessings of God, how the wicked will come at you and condemn you for the blessings that you're receiving. But hey, they might overcome you if you let those blessings get to you. You get full of them and then you fall before them. No, you need to stay aware of your surroundings. Don't forget the God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Don't forget the God that brought thee out of the very house of bondage. Continue to fear him. Continue to serve him. Continue to swear only by his name and go after him only as your God. Fear him, love him, delight in him, and praise him for the same.